right at the moment as people reflect on what's happened in the last several months in America. And what I want to talk about is this idea that, for me, an aspect of capitalism that I want to replicate is growth. That I want the movement and activism to grow. I think that's good for activism. I think that when you start with a group of people and you have a meeting and you want to do something like economic justice, the next time you have an event or meeting, it's more. And the time after that, it's more people. And the time after that, it's more people. Every time you do something, you have more people at it. That, to me, sounds like a good idea. That's what I want to have activism mean. However, in my 30 years of activism, not every movement does that. Sometimes they start out real slow and grow slow. Sometimes they start out real slow and die. Sometimes they're fast out of the block, but mushroom and disappear as quickly. And sometimes, very rarely, they take off, they're big, and they sustain to attain their goal. So I like to highlight that last category. Because if you can do it, then there's something right about what they're doing. And we should be, in my opinion, replicating that. So I'm biased, to be sure. It also reflects the work that I do for my career, so I want to be transparent and give my disclaimer. What's your work? Consensus decision making and teaching consensus. Um, and I've written books on it, I have books here. So um, I'll get to that in the end, talk a little bit about consensus itself. But right now, like I said, I'm talking about sort of meta organizing. And the three movements that I personally took part in that shaped my activist life were the what most people would call now the Clamshell Alliance protesting nuclear power in the early 80s. Food Not Bombs, which I was in the original collective of, helped start, and is still around today and is gigantic. And uh, the Pledge of Resistance to Prevent an Invasion of Central America, which happened in the mid 80s, late 80s. And I believe all three of those movements were very successful. And they all three grew and kept growing in various spurts and spurts and accomplished the goal they set out for themselves. Even though it's true that in, in early stages they didn't realize that. And it's only looking back in history to see that the effect they had on society was significant in outcome as well as in ideology, as information. So the Clamshell Alliance, which the part that I'm most familiar with was the very last incarnation of it, was called the Coalition for Direct Action at Seabrook. Direct action one? At Seabrook. Seabrook was a nuclear power plant built, built north of uh, Boston, 20 miles from the city of Boston. If there's a meltdown at Seabrook, the city of Boston is off, off limits. Uh, it's an insane idea. They built tunnels. They dug tunnels out to the ocean to fall on the coast to cool the core so they don't have cooling towers. And so while they were building, the, the, they built, dug this big hole that went out to the ocean. And while they were doing that hole, we tried to occupy the site so that they could not, we were going to put our bodies literally in front of the bulldozers. And so there's a lot of parallel, you might hear in that, to what just happened in the last six months. It was an occupation, it involved a direct action caucus, because they wanted to make sure something got done. But one of the major differences was that we organized by affinity groups. And we used a version of consensus that worked pretty well. It was functional consensus. So, and in part because we used the affinity group structure because the affinity group structure allows for consensus to work well. I go all the way to the extreme and teach that consensus does not give standing to individuals. Voting gives standing to one, ver one person, one vote. It's very individualistic. It fits this country and the way we are. Consensus is group decision-making. It can only be done in groups. Now, it can be done inside your own head if you divide yourself up in groups, but it's, it's a model that's done in groups. And what I teach is that individuals do not have access to the process. Groups, affinity groups, autonomous, self-defined, self-actualized affinity groups observe and, and embrace the values of the larger movement. So the movement has identified values and a purpose. So in Clamshell's case, it was to stop this nuclear power plant from being built. The values were that we would not hurt human beings in the process of doing that, that we would educate ourselves and others about the issues inherent in the use of nuclear power, that education was the first major obligation of the activist. The second was to organize large numbers of people, not just ourselves, to recognize that nuclear power was dangerous. 
And then the third was to take action to physically stop them by putting our bodies on the line because they weren't listening to any legal maneuverings, which had already happened. The legal maneuverings had been overlooked. We actually won in the courts and they just changed the laws. So we said that the, the, the legal maneuverings, they're not listening to the people, they're gonna build it anyway, we have to put our bodies on the line. So we organized by affinity groups. The reality was, and so the two, two uh, protests that I participated in involved thousands of activists. All of them organized into very small groups. Each affinity group brought their own sustainable action. In other words, they had somebody in each affinity group trained in you know, being the medic, you know, that brought the band-aids and the sprained ankle bench. Each, and of course, then, then there was the medic meeting where all the different people from the various things came together to talk about how to manage the medical situation. Then we had even a whole special affinity group just to do the the uh, the, the, me the, med the medical aspect. But each affinity group had their own uh, medical person, their own media person, their own um, uh, food person. And then when you needed it to be done collectively, those people got together and did it collectively. So we came with automatic organization. And each affinity group planned that on their own in a separate meeting but then came to spokes councils once a week or once a month, later is once a month, once a week, where the spokespeople would coordinate and plan the actions according to the purpose that was already pre-decided, shutting down the plan, and the values that we don't, they, they were sloppy about the values, but they were there. That's the model. Now, of course, what actually happened was that we were beaten back brutally. I myself was beaten unconscious in May 1980 at Seabrook. They were very vicious, the police were very brutal, they had a lot of police there. They probably had one cop for every protester and a half. I mean, so they, we were way outnumbered. We should have had a lot more people there, we just didn't do a good enough job. And we were impetuous, so we went ahead and acted anyway. But we had thousands, we had two, three thousand, maybe four or five. It was hard to tell. That was a pretty big protest for its era. So we tried to shut them down, we couldn't get on the site. After four days, both times, in, in October of 79 and May of 80, they, they pushed us back, and we failed, and, we, and it disbanded. Now, Food Not Bombs grew out of that failure. But the fact of the matter is, is that Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant was the last commercial nuclear power plant licensed for nuclear power in this country, and there hasn't been another one since. So in fact, we actually won that battle. We didn't stop Seabrook, we stopped everyone after that. Okay, so I think that's successful. Even though at the time we felt like failures, and we felt like it was a mistake. But again, we did, perfect, if you will, or use this affinity group model, spokes council decision making, and having a common purpose that was clearly articulated, and values that, that made our decisions for us collectively. Yeah. Now it is true that the non-violence values split us down the middle, and we did not handle it well. I'll just tell you that little story just to be instructive, okay? There's no doubt that the people who were committed to doing this action embraced Gandhi and non-violence as a whole. That was not the issue. So of the, the couple of thousand people who were organizing in, in New England, there was no question that they were dedicated to Gandhi and nonviolence. This action was not going to perpetrate violence against the police or the workers or anybody else. However, some of us wanted to get on the site by going through the marshes, the back country. We must be doing it somewhere and you missed us. Uh, cutting the fence and putting in a new gate so we could occupy the site from the backside, other people said, no, no, that's violence. That's property destruction, you can't do that. And the truth of the matter is that there's a legitimate argument for one, there's a legitimate argument for the other. Oh, good, now we're having action with the bus. Okay, so, um, so no, and there's like a thousand people who felt that cutting the fence was violent, and a thousand people who thought that cutting the fence was non-violent because violence only applies to people. And there was no amount of arguing that was going to change that. And unfortunately, we spent weeks and weeks arguing with each other and not organizing more people to show up instead of recognizing it was two groups with a common purpose. We could, and we ended up doing this anyway. Half the group went out to the marshes and cut the fence. That's where I was. I think it's kind of ironic today in Occupy how I'm being treated because I was the one who cut the fence. Okay? If you get what I'm saying there, if you know anything about what's going on for me within the current situation. And um, the other group went to the main gate, which was locked, and they sat down in the road, and they protested by having thousands of people blocking the road. That was their protest. We did it together. We could have just decided to do that five weeks earlier, 
and spend all our energy organizing instead of fighting each other. So that's what I meant by so we did it sloppy. Okay. But we were focused on our values. We were talking about nonviolence. We were arguing about what is true nonviolence and whether this action does that or not. That to me is healthy. That's what you want a group to be doing, talking about its values and why it's doing what it's planning to do. Okay? So that's the first model. The second model is Food Not Bombs. Food Not Bombs was a, an affinity group. It was one of these autonomous, self-sustaining affinity groups that came out of this era. Um, the actual story is that one of our ultimate members, Brian, was at May 1980. At May 1980, there was an incident with the state police where one of the police officers got hurt by a grappling hook that somebody threw. And they picked Brian because he had been on national TV and charged him with the crime. And that was really significant because it was a felony charge and Brian had just graduated from law school and you can't practice law if you have a felony. So they were about to take away his law school degree. So we were the people that gathered around him to, to fight his case we were successful as an affinity group action. We hung together, we defended him, we went to court, we got him off. He was acquitted. And just as an aside again, on the, the day of court, his mom was there, this is in New Hampshire, his mom lived in New York City. Um, she came up and we had f six guys who all looked exactly the same. The reason why I knew Brian was because everybody thought I was him and he was me. And, and we both looked the same, full, full hippie. And, uh, so we had six of us sitting there, and I the whole day acted like I, that was my mom. I knew her. I mean, I, I knew her. So, so she pretended like I was her son, and I was. And they couldn't pick Brian out of the crowd. They, line, you know, they couldn't say who was the defendant. The cop said, I, I don't know which one it is. So the judge didn't like that much. But that wasn't the ultimate reason was because they had a video of who actually threw the grappling hook, and it wasn't Brian. But somebody did actually. I actually met the guy years later. We always thought it was a lie. But it turned out somebody really did throw a grappling hook at the cops. It broke the guideline and made us. But, it, but Food Not Bombs came out of it, so maybe it was a good thing. Anyway, so the original Food Not Bombs group um, was an affinity group. And we were fledgling at our use of consensus. But what we understood was that we needed to be able to have people's, what you might call for shorthand, buy-in. Their commitment to why you're doing whatever you're going to do. Especially when you're a group this size. If this group's going to decide to do something, if it's really going to happen, you want everybody in this group, and if you're going to be an ongoing group, to at the very least say, I'm okay with it. At the very least, if they're, if they're resisting, if they're holding back, if they're going to be resentful, then the next decision you make is going to be impacted by that resentment, that holding back, never mind the current decision. See, it isn't just a single decision, it affects the whole dynamics of the group ongoing. So while we didn't know consensus very well, and I hadn't written my book yet, and I was still just learning it, what we did understand was that we had to trust each other very, very deeply. We had to learn to trust each other very, very deeply. It didn't come with the territory. Even though we mostly looked the same, we were all white, we were all young college kids, you know, all pretty well educated, you know, but still, you know, the men and the women, lots of issues going on there. Even, you know, then the lovers and the non-lovers and the homosexuality and the, well, there's a lot of stuff going on that we were having a hard time trusting. This is a small little affinity group, right? And so we developed this idea I think, again, this is very, very important. We had this thing at the very beginning of the Food Not Bombs Collective. We said, each bona fide member, once you become a member of the collective, we you live in the house, we were full time doing it, you know, 24-7, 365, and any bona fide member of the group, of the collective, could call group group. It's a group meeting to talk about the group. And when a member calls group group, it has to happen within 48 hours, and every member has to be there. And once the meeting starts, we cannot end it until everybody's satisfied. And sometimes group group went on for more than a day. We slept in the living room and then got up in the morning. We had breaks for meals and we break for sleeping and pee breaks and all that. But we came back to the meeting and we did nothing else but work on it. And of course, there was issues of asking somebody to leave the group. That was the first and the major reason why it happened. It also happened for security issues. A rape happened in our house. We had to deal with that, you know. So this is a way that we could show our commitment to each other, and we did, and it was powerful because we had that commitment. So that's an example of the level of kind of bonding that I'm talking about an affinity group can do to be able to do the things.